welcome to another episode of the Momentum Interview Series. Today, I'm speaking to Alexandra Ferdon, the Senior Manager for Global Deal Strategy and Operations at Miro. Alexandra, thank you so much for making the time for us today. Let's jump right into it. Some people work best as independent contributors and others as team players. How has your own collaboration styles changed over the years? It's kind of funny because I think um, my career was probably a little different than most in that like, I actually started with management. Um, and so I did that for the first like four years of my career, um, which I think was great because it was like super team oriented. And I think that really like instilled <clears throat> that mindset for me. Um, but I also think like individual contributor roles are like really, really helpful and beneficial. So like when I pivoted careers to go kind of from more retail and management into like tech and sales, um, I like very consciously wanted to take on an individual contributor role because I really wanted to like build up my technical skills and like really feel confident in my own um, like knowledge and skills. And so I think it's actually really good throughout a career to like dip in and out of being an IC or a manager. And I think it usually suits too if you, you kind of want to like rebuild that confidence or technical skills or whatever it is um, to kind of go into an IC and then back into a manager role. And then looking back through your previous roles, would you say there's been a common professional thread between them or have they vastly differed from one another? So I, I think there's definitely been a common thread. I, I think probably when, when people sometimes look at my resume, it looks maybe not because I, like I said, I, I was in retail for a while um, and then kind of like moved into sales ops, which looked pretty like disjointed. But really, I think they actually were super similar. Like when I was at Target, it's like I was managing teams and also like managing operations and like an entire business, right? And so essentially when like you're in sales operations or deal desk, like you're doing a lot of a similar thing where like you're cultivating relationships, you're influencing without authority, um, but you're also using data to solve problems. And I think like people and data have been a very common theme throughout any role you're in and just kind of connecting the dots between those two things. You went from working at Tumblr in San Francisco to a deal desk analyst role in Dropbox's Ireland office, which is quite the country move. What's the biggest adjustment you had to make during that time? Even though there are different like nuances of like industries or verticals, like it's largely like a pretty similar strategy. Um, I think when you're working on like Latium, then, you know, there's, there's a little bit more like nuanced. But EMEA is just, um, was so different, again, from a business perspective, because mm -hmm. like what works in like the DAC market is not what works in like the Spanish market or like the UK market. And so it was just so interesting because I think you have such a more like nuanced approach. And so I always think it's really important like for deal desk to um, like drive consistency across mm -hmm everything like deal desk if it's a global team like you don't want the U.S. saying one thing and the U.S. saying another so I think it's really important for the team to be consistent but also know where we need to localize. Speaking of different markets at one point you were senior manager of deal strategy and operations at Dropbox and you led a team yes. that supported over 10 global sales teams operationally so just purely out of curiosity what's the biggest difference between how business is done in Dublin versus Tokyo versus San Francisco? from like the management side, right? Of just kind of working with different people from all over. Like I definitely think like what motivates someone or drives someone is kind of different depending on like culture and stuff like that, as well as even like working style and like working culture and like communication. Um, like for example, like in Tokyo, it's a, it's a lot more of like, how do we like work less? Um, you know, like Tokyo is a very much like a uh, very hard work culture, not that like the US and EMEA are it, but like Tokyo definitely takes it to an extreme. So from like a management perspective, it was like, how do we mitigate that? Um, whereas like, yeah, in the US and EMEA, like it's definitely, I think a more, at least in EMEA, maybe like a work hard, play hard. Like, I think there's a lot of like respect of time off and all of that, which is like, I think really healthy and really good. Um, but then, yeah, I think from like a, a business perspective and like kind of a customer and like sales perspective, they were quite different. So like I mentioned, like you have a lot of like regulatory things you're dealing with in EMEA. Like you think about like doc or you think about like the banking industries or any of like the public sector, like EMEA definitely like you would be 
sending an order form to get like physically signed by someone and then they would have to like physically sign it and send it back to our VP to sign and um you know in the US that's pretty unheard of and then like in Tokyo like it's all about like being super clear and super upfront about like what is happening so um for example with certain selling models that have like a lot of flexible licensing like that's that wasn't huge in our market in Tokyo cuz Tokyo is like we need predictable we need to know exactly like what we're signing up for whereas like in the US that was our most popular selling model so it's very interesting of just like how the culture seeps into not just like management but also like how we sell and how we work with customers so while you were at Dropbox you had a number of direct reports on your team what's the biggest leadership lesson that period taught you a huge thing i focused on um whether it be like mentoring someone or one of my direct reports or a full-time employee contractor like it doesn't really matter it's really about like where they want to go and what their motivation is and like what their growth plan is like i try to always make a growth plan with any of my direct reports and like under like mutually understand like where they want to get to next um and that can really vary like i i always say people kind of go through different phases in their life like sometimes like it's super like full steam ahead i want to get to this next level or i want to become a manager or i want to get to xyz and sometimes it's like i want to do a good job but like i also have a lot going on outside of work and like that's kind of my focus and i think either one is fine um and so i think it's about like getting that like mutual trust with your team and figuring out what's right for them and then like tailoring to each person and could just continue on the thread of leadership when you think about your current role at Miro as senior manager of global desk strategy and operations what do you spend most of your time doing for context i i joined miro back in february and like before that there was no deal desk team and so if i had to um if i had to summarize it i think it's a mixture of like deal strategy and and kind of looking at our biggest enterprise customers and like how we want to kind of address that um because obviously that's a huge important part of our business and then second would be like looking at the transactional uh with my team and saying like okay what do we need to improve from a systems perspective mm-hmm. and then i think taking a step back and then looking at like market trends and saying like okay what are we seeing with compete or what are we seeing with like where we need to add more playbooks for sales because we're coming across like these common issues so those would be the three Speaking of selling and deals, what are some friction points affecting most deal desk teams today? There's kind of I think two. So, I guess from a very like simple side of just like day to day, like what is difficult, um I would say like the amount of slack usage is very difficult for deal desk. And the reason why I say that is because uh, in most companies, like deal desk will work in some sort of a ticketing queue. right so like at some companies it might be jira or zendesk um or a salesforce queue or whatever it is because essentially like deal desk is a support function and so you need to track like what your um what you're doing because that's also often how then we get headcount or can kind of show like ROI and stuff like that and so miro uses slack like more than i've ever seen it um and so i think that sometimes that can be troubling for deal desk because you're doing a ton of work and you're not necessarily like <clears throat> connecting it back to salesforce or like really like getting credit for it for lack of a better word um and so it's funny cuz uh i actually think that's where some of the conversation started with momentum was actually like looking at some different tools that can help to connect salesforce and slack because i think that it's like you know if we use slack and we're comfortable with it then that's great but like we need more integration with salesforce to have like that source of truth to back up um all of those slack messages so i think that's like the simple like more transactional side that's challenging for deal desk and i've kind of actually heard this from across a lot of different leaders i talk to um that slack can be like super super difficult uh for deal desk teams because <laughs> it's just so many things um but yeah so that's one side of it and then i think the other side of it is like deal desk <clears throat> deal desk essentially should always be like the single source of truth for all complex contracts pricing quotes proposals deal structures and like coordinating approvals right 
but because like their focus is around like these complex deals, you're yeah. always operating in a lot of gray area. And a lot of times it's like uncharted waters. And so I think one of the struggles deal desk is always going to have is like, what, what do we need to streamline and what do we need to turn from gray to like black and white and what needs to like stay as a gray area. Um, and I think that can be challenging because I think if you're not consistently taking a step back and evaluating, um, it's very easy to stay in that gray area and like everything stays complex or everything stays high touch. And essentially like what you always want to be doing is you always want to be moving from high touch to medium touch to low touch, right? You always want to be like, how do we streamline? How do we like use our system and process to like make this so we're not a friction point in a deal? So I think without that consistent review, um, it can get very easy for deal desk just to always kind of be a touch point on a deal. And essentially we always want to be like improving our process and system to not be a touch point. And I mean, even with all that friction, one still expects great performance from any deal desk. So what are your three metrics for judging the performance of your deal desk? Most important to me would be like the number of deals that deal desks is supporting, right? Mm. So kind of looking at like, what's the percentage of deals that are coming through deal desk? I think over time, like one of the biggest goals is like, how do we make it so deal desk is deal desks <laughs> percentage of goal of deals that they're working on is going down over time? Because if you have less like tickets or whatever it is on deals, what that means is that sales is able to self-serve that themselves. And so that means that deal desk on the back end has been doing system improvements, like trainings, enablement, and like process improvements so that sales can go through the sales cycle without needing a touch point. And that's the ultimate goal. So I think that's the number one for me. Um, but I think also in general, you always have like increasing the sales velocity or just kind of like, how do we close deals quicker? How do we remove roadblocks? Um, you know, if, if we have like 10 touches on a deal from internal teams, like how do we streamline that and, and better document so that we, we don't need 10 touches, it's five. Um, and then I think another one that I'm really interested in is like expansion rates and ARR by account. So like, how are we growing the ARR of our accounts over time? Let's take a bird's eye view of the industry at large. What are some of the trends in deal desk management that companies should be aware of? One of the like trends in deal desk management is like, I guess just one having a deal desk team, right? Like probably like five, 10 years ago, like this was a very, uh, uncommon, um, team in a, in a lot of companies. Yeah. And so, um, I think we're in a really interesting spot right now. Cause I think there's, there's more and more emphasis where pretty much it's like, this is what revenue operations should be hiring for. Like, this is what you should have when you kind of get to a certain point. But I think, um, like in terms of what to be aware of, I think there's very much like a sweet spot of when you want to hire a deal desk, right? Cause you don't necessarily want to hire a deal desk maybe when you're like just kind of starting to get your enterprise deals in my opinion and it kind of depends right because deal desk can be more order management -y or it can be more strategic um and so i guess i'm talking more about more of the strategic side of like complex deals and and all of that stuff um but i think that you kind of have to find a sweet spot of when you're trying to hire for this because essentially what deal desk can really like help to help to do is like supporting on those complex deals or like standardizing controls and process as the company scales. So both of those things I think are not um, going to be as beneficial to a company that's maybe like earlier on, right? Like sometimes you need to just like let sales sell and then like just kind of rocket ship up, right? And then you bring deal desk in and then they can start to like tame the beast and be like, hey, we really need to make sure these order forms are being sent through a CLM or we really need to make sure that like we're reviewing every deal before opportunity closure. But like, that's not something that's gonna be as beneficial when someone's like really taking off. So I think timing is, is pretty um, interesting about when you're kind of building out your deal desk team. And let's talk tools for a little bit. What's your sales stack like at Miro? We use Salesforce and then Salesforce CPQ for our CRM. And then we also have a CLM, which we use Spring CM um, and DocuSign. Um, and then we have Gong for intelligence and Crayon for compete. 
and then guru, which we use for sales enablement. So guru is essentially like, yeah, it's like little like cards. Um, but we, we've been using that a lot and really like doubling down. I think you've heard me talk about process and documentation a lot today. So guru is a big one in my, in my sales stack. Um, and then again, we've kind of touched on, on this a little bit before, but we use like zoom, Gmail, Slack, as we talked about, uh, and Miro to collaborate, um, kind of like internally, um, which is great. Like, actually, I will say we use Miro a lot. Like we use it for like forecast calls. We use it for projects. We use it for, um, like literally everything. And so I I think it's great to be at a company that really like drinks its own champagne and like really uses its own tooling because that's huge for our collaboration. Absolutely. Dog fooding your own product is key. Yeah. And having been in management for so long, what's the biggest challenge you feel leaders face when it comes to running sales teams? Balancing the ability to use data to inform decisions and also use data to like validate, you know, whether it be like a forecast or whatever it is, but also having like the more like human side of it to have flexibility that like situations are different for certain customers. Um, and that like, you kind of need to find that balance of, okay, here's what it should be, or here's what the data is saying, but also here's what the customer is saying. And, and mm-hmm. so I think having that mixture of both like data, as well as some ability to operate in gray area and understand it on a customer to customer level is super important. A lot of that feeds into the culture that a sales leader would need to build for the team and the organization at large. What kind of culture has management at Miro tried to build and how's that been going? I think some of the like key cultural pillars that, you know, Miro management has been trying to build is like around teamwork, around empathy, like having those qualities. um, And then also having quality of like being a self-starter. And I guess like why I say kind of self-starters is because I think Miro does a really good job where everyone at Miro like wants to bring Miro to the next level. Like everyone I think is working towards this like common goal that we want it to be like the best company. And like, we want to get to the next, you know, revenue mark or the next like big product launch. Like there, there's a lot of like teamwork and rallying around kind of this bigger goal, which I think is super impressive, especially in light of the fact that like we've doubled um, our headcount and then like tripled it. And so it's very impressive that there's still very much like a common goal. And I think the other piece of it is um, empathy, which I think is great that that's one of like Miro's pillars. Uh, Even before I joined Miro, like people would ask me, what's one of the number one things you look for when you're hiring for deal desk? And one of the biggest things is empathy, like technical skills aside, like deal desk is in a tough position where I think sometimes you're saying no without saying no. Um, Or some some people are just saying no, but uh, those people usually would not be on my team. So with, with empathy and emotional intelligence playing a big role in what you're looking for in a candidate, let's look at the flip side of that. What would be an instant red flag for you when you're hiring a candidate? inability to be flexible um is is one uh and just like not being customer centric so pretty much like someone who's gonna kind of just see the rule book and be like this is it um I I think would be kind of a deal breaker for me um but yeah I pretty much any any of those things that can't be like coached or developed um are a little bit deal breakers because I think deal desk has to be a bit a bit flexible. We obviously make rules in process, but we also need to know when they need to be bent. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that is exactly the correct. Not broken. Point. Not broken. Not broken bent. Just, just, just <laughs> slightly massaged in a different direction. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Just curved. Um, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Let's get a little personal for a little bit. So you know, we always talk about product tips and whatnot. And they're usually subjective, but in your opinion, what is your best productivity tip? I think if I'm feeling very formal or like I'm dealing with a huge problem, like doing a prioritization matrix is very helpful. But to be honest, usually like I operate on to-do lists and just kind of being like, what needs to be done? What would I like to get done? And what's just something I like need to write down so I don't forget about it later. (laughs) 
<laughs> and so that's usually how I operate. And then like on a very simple level, uh, just turning off Slack notifications and booking focus time, I think mm. is very necessary and something I probably need to do more of. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that woodpecker notification sound gives a lot of people a lot of stress. Uh, yeah. Amazing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't even have sound on my Slack notifications, and I still need it off. Um, that's like the first thing I do when I join a company is like turn off notification sound, and then just like mute all the channels, on, on, apart from the, the most. Yeah. Important. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then exactly. In, in terms of content that you're consuming at the moment, which book or podcast or show are you going to be reading or binging on? For book, I am reading Man's Search for Meeting by Viktor Frankl, mm -hmm. um, which is very interesting. I also just read another book that was actually about Vienna during the Second World War. So I guess I'm on like a bit of a trend of like Viennese people and World War II. Um, and <laughs> for podcasts, I would say... Like when I want something fun, I listen to a podcast called Smartless, um, which is, do you know, like Will Arnett and um, Jason, why am I forgetting, Bateman, and then Sean Hayes. They're like three actors who are randomly friends and they pretty much just have like banter for an hour um, and they interview people, but like, I wouldn't even call it interviewing because it's like, they just talk to each other and their poor like guests are just like, hi, I'm here. Um, so it's very funny and that's like for light. And then I also love the knowledge project, um, which is great. It's like really cool, like in-depth interviews about like all sorts of things. So I love that one. If you weren't working in deal desk management, what would you be doing instead? Managing a winery or like working in food of some sort. Um, I would love to do. And it probably helps that you live in Nap in wine country. <laughs> so yeah, I just need to start asking around. <laughs> So it might, might be time to, uh, to kind of inform your colleagues at Miro to get ready to come and visit your brand I know. venue. I, know. If you were I starting, think they already know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I think they've probably gotten the hints by now. <laughs> if you were starting a career all over again, what would you do differently? Yeah. So I think it's interesting. Like, I think one thing I'm probably always going to be insecure about, like as many, like, things as I can read and study and stuff like that is like not having more of a technical or like business background. Mm -hmm. So if I were starting my career over again, like I feel like I would probably get more of a technical or business degree. I studied communications and English and like, while I do actually see a lot of value in that and like, I'm, you know, very grateful for my education. I feel like, especially, um, in business and like, you know, in, in kind of my work, I'm always a little insecure about some of my more technical skills. So um, I'd probably focus on that. I think another way to look at it would be that, you know, working in deal desk management, a lot of what you're doing is negotiating the terms of a deal and the transfer of value from, you know, the client to your company and vice versa. And the fact that you studied communication, I feel gives you an edge over someone who would have maybe studied something super technical in engineering or finance or something like that. And, you know, lacking those key negotiation skills, which at the end of the day is really what pushes the deal forward. So I'd say you, yeah. you actually have an edge, Alex. I appreciate that. Mo. It's very nice. Um, but yes, I, I mean, yeah, I agree. I still think there's so much value in those degrees. I think it's just, you know, you always have your like insecurities. Um, but yeah, I appreciate, appreciate your words. Most welcome. Thank you so much for making the time to speak to us today. Alex, I'll catch you next time. Thank you so much. This is great. Appreciate it.